medical officers be especially alert to detect all persons with constitutional psychopathy and other persons who later may disrupt discipline and morale. In this general group are to be grotesque and pathological liars, vagabonds, petty offenders, swindlers, kleptomaniacs, pyromaniacs, alcoholic persons, and homosexual persons. I was interested in the adventure and the excitement. I mean, I just was going for, to save the world, for democracy. My mother protested because I was a nice young lady from a good family and I was expected to go to college and get married, not go to the Navy. Made by me. That all statements made by me. As now given in this record. As now given in this record. Are correct. Are correct. I didn't hear anything about uh, about being queer when I went in. I didn't even know what the word existed when I went in the Navy. It just wasn't part of the vocabulary or part of the conversation. You went into a an office with a, I guess he was a psychiatrist, I don't know, and he had some more questions. Of course, one of the questions he asked me was how I felt about girls, and I said, I like them, I'm engaged to be married. And he said, oh, fine, and that was it. He never asked me how I felt about men, or I would have told him I like them, too. I was in the colored army. We knew that we were there because of the law. We were not allowed to serve our country as equals. And the laws of the country were against you. And if you were also identified as a gay person, that was a double whammy. While fear of exposure trapped some in a world of solitude, others found each other, gradually realizing that they were not the only ones in the armed forces. Ironically, military service gave many the opportunity to enjoy a gay camaraderie they had not known in their hometowns. These new friendships gave lesbian and gay GIs a temporary refuge from the official hostility that surrounded them. We didn't see any obvious signs of a purge going on. Uh, no one had been called in, there had been no interrogations, but there was this rumor going around. How it got started, I don't know. Probably because maybe there had been a purge on some other base, and there was a thought that there might be one on ours. But all of a sudden, the gay people in my unit became rather self-conscious. We all uh, began saying to each other, well, maybe we're too obvious. Maybe our friendships with each other are, too, are causing problems. I think we reacted uh, in a paranoid fashion. We all became very afraid that something was going to happen. In 1977, after four tries, Harvey Milk became San Francisco's first openly gay supervisor. Known as the mayor of Castro Street, Milk devoted his life to lesbian and gay rights and the rights of all minorities. He led the passage of a gay civil rights bill for San Francisco and was instrumental in the defeat of one of the first anti-gay initiatives. After only 11 months in office, he was assassinated by fellow supervisor Dan White. His early death was, and still is, a great loss. The legacy of Harvey Milk lives on. I'm here with four students from the Hedrick Martin Institute's Harvey Milk School. Who can tell me something about Harvey Milk's life? He was a gay, outspoken man of San Francisco, California. He was a wonderful role model for you all over the country. Uh -huh. I think he set up um, kind of like a household name for gay people because they were, never, they, were, they were never talked about in the home. And Harvey Milk, being a politician and whatnot, was really talked about and he's kind of like brought us into the home so that we could be spoken about and people might accept us more. It's important to remember the contributions of those who have paved the way for a new generation. The story of Harvey Milk has been recorded in a book, The Mayor of Castro Street, and also an Academy Award-winning documentary. 
Now, here in New York, rehearsals have begun for, of all things, a new opera based on his life. Three major companies have teamed up to bring Harvey Milk, the opera, to life. This new work opens at the New York City Opera this spring and moves on to San Francisco in 1996. The Houston Grand Opera, the New York City Opera, and the San Francisco Opera commissioned Harvey Milk, and I think it says a lot about how much things have changed uh, in our world today. There's still a long way to go, but I think they all realized that Harvey Milk was an important American hero and somebody whose life was, it was important to portray on the operatic stage. It's a recurring tragedy in American history that people like Harvey Milk, who uh, are really at the moment where they're about to change the world and have their greatest effect, are cut down. Many people know of the assassination and they know of the defense where White was freed by saying that he ate too many Twinkies and went into temporary insanity. But they don't know the importance of Harvey Milk's life, the eras of change that he passed through in American politics, uh, the fact that he lived in a closet, was a Wall Street stockbroker, radically changed himself, became a grassroots politician, and empowered thousands and thousands of people. Harvey Milk was a heroic character. Uh, at least as he's portrayed in the opera, and I think that we haven't really changed uh, him from real life, in, in essence. He's uh, a big person involved with the big ideas uh, at a certain time. In some ways, it reminds me of another American opera, Porgy and Bess, which is about a certain American subgroup at a certain time in history, uh, and it lends itself to opera. I mean, it's just, it's beautifully written to be sung. One thing that really was, we found compelling about Harvey Milk was that he was able to transform himself from in, in very radical directions. When he started out as a young man, he was a Goldwater Republican and a stockbroker living in a closet in New York. And for this person to then drop out, grow his hair along, move to the Castro, live in a shabby camera store, become a street politician, was quite a radical change. And in fact, it was one of the things that inspired us about his life, the potential for one man first to change himself and then to go out and change the world. Harvey is a story about a man who, who, was, who found his purpose late in life and uh, was really there to help others. He wasn't just there even for gay people in his campaigning. He was a big uh, uh, advocate for senior citizens and for disabled people. Any disenfranchised, powerless groups uh, were people that Harvey wanted to serve. So um, it's not just about being gay or straight or anything else. It's a, it's a story about a person who wanted to make a difference and did. Harvey Milk the Opera is about Harvey Milk the Man, but it's also about how Harvey Milk the Man embodied the trajectory of the gay rights movement. So it's really a history of the gay rights movement as embodied in Harvey Milk. I don't think um, it would ever have been a school named after him if it wasn't for him, you know. Um, to go to that school is a very safe, safe environment, you know, which I appreciate and that's what we need, you know, as being gay and being known. I would say to other young people to be proud of themselves and who they are and being gay and lesbian and to be careful who they come out to because the world is scary. As I used to think from my own personal experience that the world was so understanding and that they would understand everything that I was talking about, everything that I felt. But it's not always like that. But thanks to people like Harvey Milk, there is, there is, the people tend to be more lenient towards homosexuality than they were in the past. The qualities these students so admire in Harvey Milk are those that have inspired all the veterans we honor tonight. Passion and compassion, courage, conviction, and pride. I'm Katherine Linton. For all of us at In the Life, thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time. I realized that some people could look at my life and say, oh, it was so sad, and he died of AIDS, and isn't that tragic? But what I want to come through is that even after all the pain and all the torture and even having AIDS, I can honestly say being gay is the greatest gift I was ever given. I wouldn't change it for the world.
we don't have is For a home video of this episode of In the Life, featuring interviews with Melissa Etheridge, B.D. Wong, and Bill T. Jones, call 1-800-627-ON-TV, or send a check or money order to In the Life, 30 West 26th Street, New York, New York, 10010. In the Life is funded in part by the H. Van Amerinken Foundation. Additional support provided by Michael A. Lepin, Jeffrey B. Soreff, Eldon W. Tamblin, the Gay and Lesbian Business and Consumer Expo, and In the Life members nationwide. For more information about In the Life, get a free sample broadcast guide. Call 1-800-627-ON-TV or write to In the Life, 30 West 26th Street, New York, New York, 10010.